Um, good afternoon. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the potential for um, groundwater to be transported to the Great Barrier Reef um, and transporting nutrients to the Great Barrier Reef. So we really don't have all the answers for this at the moment, so I'm just going to talk through what sort of data we do have, what sort of information we have um, to come up with some estimates, and what the knowledge gaps are, and some ideas for future research. Um, but I'm very much open to suggestions, so this is early stages for um, trying to address this problem, so any suggestions and ideas are more than welcome. So the Great Barrier Reef is World Heritage listed. It's the largest um, coral reef in the world and it has environmental significance due to very high ecological diversity and also the um, presence of sort of critically endangered species such as um, the giant um, green turtle and also the dugong. Um, but there's some threats to the Great Barrier Reef um, and some of the impacts are coming from the agricultural production in the adjacent catchments. Um, so there's quite a lot of um, catchments all the way down the eastern coast of Australia that we call the GBR catchments that feed directly into the Great Barrier Reef. And the agricultural production over the last 150 years has really contributed to the decline in the water quality in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so the discharge through um, the rivers to the Great Barrier Reef has been identified as the largest source of nutrients, but there's still a lot of uncertainty about how much is coming through groundwater pathways. So one of the GBR catchments um, of particular interest is the Lower Burdekin catchment, so that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, so this is the Lower Burdekin catchment, so to fly from Sydney to Townsville just to get some bearings, it's about three hours flight um, north up to Townsville. Um, and the, the Lower Burdekin um, catchment is an area where we've had a fair bit of groundwater research, so that's giving us some basis to start addressing these questions about groundwater pathways. Um, but we still really don't have a good estimate of how much nutrients is, are getting through um, to the Great Barrier Reef. So the predominant pathways for groundwater transport um, are via base flow to the creeks and rivers in the Lower Burdekin um, from, the, um, from beneath the irrigated land, um, and then also direct submarine groundwater discharge um, through the um, bay there. So both of those pathways, pathways are important. Um, so what information have we got? So the Lower Burdekin catchment, it's about 850 square kilometres and more than half of the catchment uh, is irrigated. The primary crop is sugarcane um, and it's still flood irrigation throughout this area. So there's a couple of farms that are starting to trial different irrigation methods, but the um, vast majority is flood irrigated. Um, so those are the constants across the Lower Burdekin. But there's also a bit of diversity um, in the Lower Burdekin. There's, there's two different areas and they're actually managed quite differently. So the um, newer part of the irrigation area is called the Burdekin Horton Water Supply Scheme. And some of the characteristics of this area um, are the soils. So the soils are mostly cracking clays, very high clay content, often up to 70%. Sodic duplex soils, so very high um, sodicity, so quite difficult to manage. Um, so for these soils, um, gypsum has been applied to try and increase the infiltration rates into the soils, um, enable crops to be grown. Um, but the, more recently, there started to be problems with rising water tables. Um, so with these very high um, irrigation rates, with flood irrigation, um, and then applying um, gypsum to increase infiltration, there's starting to be issues with the rising water tables. And then some of the consequences of this, um, in some places the water tables have risen so high um, that saline water is starting to get into the crop roots. Um, and it's also starting to increase the amount of discharge of um, saline and sometimes um, polluted water with nutrients and pesticides into the river. So it's starting to get an increase in um, discharge into the river. Um, and the other part of the Burdekin catchment, the um, eastern part, is the older part of the irrigation area, the delta. Um, in this area, the, sand, the soils are much sandier, so much more freely draining. Um, there's been artificial recharge practiced in this area um, for, I think, more than 100 years now, um, so to try and prevent seawater intrusion. So the groundwater is used for irrigation here, in contrast with the Burdick and Horton, where it's mostly surface water. Um, so as well as using artificial recharge in trenches um, and in channels and, and pits, um, there's a philosophy of not being worried about over-irrigating because they know that a lot of that water is going to drain straight through the soils and, and help to also recharge the aquifer. But of course this has consequences for the water quality of the groundwater. 
So in the Lower Burdekin, there's been some different scales of research projects. Um, there's been um, some paddock scale research. So these, the three um, red uh, squares here show the different um, paddocks where we've had a lot of detailed measurements and research. And they represent three different soil types, um, dominant soil types within this area. And so I'm going to start off by um, talking about the Mulgrave area down the bottom there. So in the Mulgrave, um, we've done some field experiments. We've looked at infiltration rates. So this is where we've got very high sedicity um, soils. Um, so we started to look at how much water might get through and how that chemistry changed down the profile. Um, and then brought some of these soils back to the lab to try and see how much the hydraulic conductivity um, of the soils might be changing due to the application of gypsum. So just to try and dig a bit deeper into working out what are the factors that control deep drainage through these heavy clay um, sodic soils. Um, so we found um, significant increases in the hydraulic conductivity um, for the um, B horizon of these soils, so where the root zone is. Um, and we also found changes in hydraulic conductivity when different irrigation waters are applied. So um, this is part of the story in trying to work out the deep drainage through the soils. Um, so, and then for the next step, um, based on the laboratory results, um, we did some hydrous modelling to try and um, simulate the effects of chemistry on um, hydraulic conductivity, um, and then extended this into modelling 10 metre unsaturated zone profiles to look at how the deep drainage might change over time with dif different gypsum application frequencies and different irrigation and rainfall. So this has given us a bit of an idea of some of the processes at that particular site. Um, but it wasn't really giving us informa enough information about the management practices and how they might influence deep drainage. Um, so there's also been some APSIM modelling conducted. So APSIM is a model that's um, used a bit in Australia. It's developed by um, researchers and um, government in Australia. It's an agricultural production simulator. So it's really um, targeted at trying to incorporate all the management practices. So there's a sugarcane um, module um, and you can um, simulate anything that the farmer's um, doing on farm. So in terms of um, fallow in terms of how many retoons they use. So it's very specific management practices um, for sugarcane. And so what we're using this for is to look at the influence of the management factors um, as well as the, um, the influence of things like the soil properties and the um, differences in rainfall. Um, so we're able to come up with water balance predictions and also predictions of the nutrient fluxes um, below the root zone. Um, so, as I say, this has been um, performed in, in detail for these three paddock scale sites where we've also got some measured data to compare against. Um, but we've also had a go at trying to do it on a regional scale, um, which was a lot more challenging. It took thousands of model runs to try and get all the combinations of soil types and management factors across the lower Burdekin. Um, I guess one of the other big challenges is even when we got through all that using high performance computing and got all the model, model runs out, there's really still a lot of uncertainty. So these management practices were found to be really important in controlling the nitrate leaching um, loads. But we really don't have certainty on the spatial variability of those management practices. So it leads to a bit of uncertainty in our estimates. Um, but it does give us a bit of an idea of where the higher nitrate leaching is occurring and what the factors are that control nitrate leaching. So we're getting much higher nitrate leaching predicted um, in the delta area um, to the east. So this is where the soils were sandier, so that was to be expected. But it was um, determined that one of the other principal reasons um, was just that use of the groundwater for irrigation. So that, that cycling of um, water used for irrigation, the draining below the root zone, leads to much higher um, nitrate um, leaching in this area. But once we come up with this information about how nitrate leaching varies spatially, um, there's still a bit of a gap in trying to work out um, how much of that might get to the Great Barrier Reef. So we have got some data on groundwater nitrates. The monitoring is a bit sporadic, so we, we can't really do much in the way of trend analyses. There's only a few bores that have been monitored for a long period of time. Um, so I've just put all the data that we have over a 10-year period just so that we can start looking at where some of the hot spots are. Um, so we're getting much higher nitrate concentrations. So above the 10 milligrams per litre is, is mostly near the Burdekin River um, through the middle there. Um, but there's also some other areas, and, and a couple of studies have found um, 
that the geochemical properties in the aquifer um, are quite variable spatially um, and that there's denitrification potential at certain locations within the low vertical. So that's one of the main controls on that um, variation in groundwater nitrate um, in this area because there's high, fairly high nitrate leaching throughout. Um, so the dissolved organic carbon was found to be quite important in controlling denitrification potential, and it's quite high in the lower Burdekin just because of all that um, sugar cane, so a lot of it's derived from the sugar cane. Um, so as I say, it's quite a bit of variability in, in where, there's, where the denitrification is occurring. There's been a couple of transects that have been put in a few years ago to try and look at trends in denitrification going towards those creeks and rivers, but there's still a bit of a gap between um, where we have information in the groundwater and then the data in the rivers itself. Um, so we've still got a bit of a, a knowledge gap there. Um, there have been some previous measurements of groundwater discharge, but just the, the water flow itself. Um, so this does help us try and start answering the question. So um, there's been radon measurements for the creeks and rivers, um, and then there's been a combination of radon and radium measurements for the, um, the bay area, the Bowling Green Bay. So that's to estimate the submarine groundwater discharge. Um, so fortunately, we've actually had two periods of this um, sampling and estimates, um, but they've both occurred um, at the end of um, wet season, so we really still don't know much about the temporal variability um, in the discharge um, rates. Uh, the other issue there is that the um, discharge studies were conducted independently of the geochemical studies, um, so we're still having troubles trying to come up with um, confident estimates of these nutrient discharge loads um, with these two separate bits of information in different time periods. Um, so as I mentioned, some of the other questions, we, we really don't have that much um, idea of what's happening in the riparian zone, so the monitoring really isn't going um, into the riparian zone enough to know exactly which reactions are occurring before you get both flows of streams. Um, and a final question that seems to be important in the lower Burdekin is the influence of preferential flow pathways. So in this Burdekin Delta, um, we've got maps of the um, previous um, Burdekin River channels, um, and it looks like this might have a significant influence on the nutrient flow to the stream. So that just increases the spatial variability in the nitrate concentrations and in the flow pathways to streams. So it's just an additional challenge. Um, so some of the ideas um, that I'm thinking about for um, furthering this research is to start some new monitoring combining groundwater geochemistry with isotopic traces um, to answer those questions about what reactions are occurring. Um, and then to this time to try and make sure we do it in parallel with updated discharge uh, estimates so we get both sides of the um, picture at the same time. Um, also to conduct some experiments using sediments from the hyperreic zone to just get a much better idea about what factors are going to control um, the reactions occurring within that zone in terms of nitrate, nitrate transport and reaction. And then finally some further um, water flow and reactive transport modelling. Um, and these are the studies that we're going to be building on in um, further research projects. Um, if you wanted to have a look at the details later, I'm happy to answer questions. Time for questions. Uh, John Soon, Fresno State. Uh, I wonder what sort of model did you use to estimate uh, hydraulic conductivity or the change of hydraulic conductivity with the addition of, uh, say, gypsum? Um, so I measured, it in the, I measured it in the laboratory and then I used hydrus, which has a um, function for um, chemistry dependent hydraulic conductivity and then tested that against our laboratory results. So you do have some sort of uh, geochemical reaction model? that Hi you use. The hydrous model I used for that one. Thank yeah. you.